This isn't who you expected to hear, is it? Well, that's not the only surprise in this episode. Welcome to Battle Chat. Well, thanks to Jay for making a very different opening to my show. Uh, We're doing something different today. I'm actually doing a dual podcast with my podcasting pal, Jay Arnold, over the Atlantic. Welcome to the show, Jay. Well, thank you very much, Henry. I I, uh, definitely appreciate being invited to the uh, hallowed halls of Battle Chat uh, Stadium here. And uh... <laughs> with the thousands of viewers watching from the rows of seats above, cheering loudly. Yeah, the... <sighs> oh, no, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> there we are. Uh, sound effects. Now, the, if the folks, if the folks <laughs> in the terrace could just keep their cider bottles to themselves, we've already had a couple of injuries. We, have. Um, we, we don't do that sort of thing here. We need to keep it. Keep it toned down. You notice the folks in the box seats are keeping their you American tea cozies in place. So. You, you Americans are much better behaved than us Brits at matches like this. Uh, <laughs> my poor, confused listeners, uh, actually, uh, we are segueing nicely because I've just been recording an episode of Jay's Veteran Ward Gamer podcast. Um, so we've been talking to each other for over an hour already, in fact, uh, but we're talking about something very different. You'll have to listen to Jay's Veteran Wargamer podcast as soon as it comes out if you want to hear uh, what I've been talking to him about. But actually, I thought what I'd do today is um, give Jay the benefit of talking about himself, because he's very kindly invited me onto his podcast several times now. It must be well, four or five times, Jay. I think we must have chatted on your podcast. Uh, Something like that. You've you've definitely achieved super guest status at this point. Wow. Well, let me res- super guest. You <laughs> and Dave Tubbs and my brother Chris Arnold are the three super guests at this point. Wow. As long as I'm not superfluous, that's fine. Oh, never. <laughs> never. So hey, I you're just- all the fluous we need. <laughs> I wanted to return the favor because. Um, Jay very kindly has me just blather on most of the time talking about myself uh, and what I've been doing and what have you and my thoughts about the hobby. And I thought it's about time that basically I shut up and let him do some talking. And and also, um, if you don't know Jay and you don't know the Veteran Wargamer podcast, uh, it's about time you did um, because he's uh, he, he does great things with the podcast and we, I'm going to ask him about that. Um, but I think... One of the first things I want to explain to people about Jay and one of the things that sets him apart, actually, in the Wargaming community is that he really is a soldier. Uh, He actually is a veteran himself. He's he's seen active duty, active service. And um, I think this is, from my point of view, one of the things that drew him to me uh, very early on because as you guys all know I've been heavily involved with doing stuff for combat stress for quite a few years now gosh it must be at least 10 years maybe even longer now Um, and uh, Jay as a veteran himself I was very interested we had we had a conversation I think via Facebook messenger gosh ages ago uh, where I asked him a few things about his service and what have you and he's he's very kind of very candid in his answers and and so forth so I I kind of wanted to bring Jay on the show to talk a bit about uh, his experience about you know basically explain who the hell he is uh, and what he's done uh, something about his service and and experience but also of course, he is also a war gamer, and so we're going to talk a bit about how his service has informed his war gaming, and potentially vice versa. So, Jay, um, first of all, could you just uh, give people a little bit of background about yourself, about um, you know what your what your job is, your what your military experience is, uh, and then that that'll kind of set the scene for people. So, if you could just, um, as I say, explain a bit about who you are and what you do in 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 relationship to the military aspect of your life. Sure. Uh, well, it's 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 easy enough to start and. 
my military experience started in 1992. It sounds like a long time ago, especially when I have uh, officer candidates in my charge that are that were not born yet. <laughs> when first, when I raised my right hand in 1992. Um, now I started in the U.S. Army Reserve, and we'll. I noticed on the show notes here you. You want me to explain the difference between National Guard and the Army and whatnot? Yeah, I think that'd be but, helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a second. But I started in the U.S. Army Reserve in a psychological operations unit. I was a uh, assigned as a psychological operations specialist. I enlisted under a program called the Split Option Program, and under the Split Option Program, a recruit of the National Guard or Reserve would go to would enlist while a junior in high school that would be grade 11 for our canadian friends i'm not sure what the british analog would be and you would go to basic training between your junior and senior year of high school you would drill on the weekends with your unit uh so how during the school year so how old would you have been at that point jay I was 17. Right. Okay. In, in the U.S. forces, you can join at 17 with parental consent. Gotcha. Okay. So in, here in the U.K., that's the equivalent of someone who's just kind of in what we would call the sixth form at school here, college college level. British and uh, Right. And then uh, I completed my senior year of high school having completed basic training. And then after I graduated from high school, I went to in my – to my advanced training in the summer of 1993. Uh, graduated AIT, went back to living in Kansas City for a while and had some not great jobs and decided, you know, I, I kind of liked doing that Army thing, so I went active duty and joined the, the regular Army and was stationed at Fort Bragg for four years to, uh, to a psychological operations unit there. Got to see... Got to see Bosnia during that enlistment and then decided, well, the Army was fun while it lasted, but I'm ready to get out. So I got out and went back to the same reserve unit in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, decided to go to college and I I took a break. Uh, I took about a six year break from the from the Army and then got back in in 2006. Uh, A good friend of mine from college had been. Uh, had enlisted and joined the the Ranger Regiment, 75th Ranger Regiment. He was in 1st Battalion. Okay. And uh, he was getting out about that time. And uh, also about that same time, my dad was getting, was starting to get his retirement benefits from his time in the National Guard. Mm-hmm. And I just put two and two together and decided, hey, maybe the National Guard will work for me too. And... Uh, Enlisted in an infantry unit yep. in the Illinois Army National Guard and became an infantryman and went to Afghanistan in uh, 2008, came home in 2009. And I am currently assigned as a as the senior platoon trainer NCO, non-commissioned officer for the Illinois Army National Guard's officer candidate school wow. in Springfield, Illinois. It's a it's a very highfalutin way of saying I yell at people. <laughs> Best that's job that's in the not world. all of it. I I actually do. I try to do as little yelling as I can. To be honest with you, it's a it's a very aggressive leadership school where we only in reality we only have about sixty days, sixty sixty two days, something like that, to take a look at a candidate. And see if they are, if they have the potential to be a second lieutenant. And we have to manufacture stress. And one of the ways that we manufacture stress is by raising the volume of our voices. And, or modulating the volume of our voices, I (laughs) should say. Because it's not all yelling. Sometimes the most effective thing you can do is just get about two inches from someone's ear and just say in a very stern manner, what is it that you think you are accomplishing right now? And, uh, that, that gets them thinking. Cause anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. I really love what I'm doing in the guard now. Um, I had a, I had a not great officer. I had a not great platoon leader 
when we went to Afghanistan. And he was a graduate of OCS. And part of my personal remit for what I do is I don't want another officer like that getting into the Illinois Army National Guard. Gotcha. And I have the benefit of having been recruited to the position by some very good NCOs. Uh, and they mentored me and shaped me and allowed me to be the instructor that I am now. And I'm, I'm grateful to them. Uh, Joe L and I'm not going to use their real names, Joe or full names, Joe L and Justin R. Uh, I really appreciate what they, what they did for me. They helped turn me into the NCO I am now for sure. Cool. Um, uh, as well, it's quite an interesting uh, career path that you've had there, Jay. Uh, and because there's, there's there's two questions that arise, uh, I think, for well, one that would interest <clears throat> everyone, and another one that I think would be particularly useful for uh, the British audience. And and let's take the second one first. So, so first of all, could you explain in general terms uh, what the difference is between the regular army? Uh, the Reserve and the National Guard in the United States? Because obviously here in the UK, we have the regular army and we have the territorial army. Um, Mm -hmm. And then some uh, soldiers, when they leave the army, are also kept on, if you like, the active reserve. The territorial army, we've always associated with particular uh, regions of the UK. They have strong regional links. Is that the same with the National Guard in the USA, Yes and no. Um, Basically, you've got it broken down. You've got the army. Well, actually, all the forces. You've got the regular army or, you know, you've got the Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps and Coast Guard. And those are all active duty. They they operate under. I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds, but not too far. Don't worry. They operate under statutory guidance under what's called Title 10. All right. And they are federally, uh, federally mandated, federally funded, federal control forces. Gotcha. Now we also have the reserve, yeah. which is still federally funded and federally controlled. And we've got uh, Army Reserve, Navy, Naval Reserve, Marine Reserve, uh, Air Force Reserve, mm. and. Then we also have the National Guard, and the National Guard is broken into the Army National Guard and the Air Guard. The difference with the National Guard as opposed to the regular or reserve forces is that they are under state control. And there are 54 states and states, territories, and protectorates that all have National Guard. So, for example, we have National Guard units in Guam. We have we have National Guard in Puerto Rico. We have uh, National Guard in Washington, Washington D.C., and I want to say, what's the fifty-fourth? Is it? Is it the U.S. Virgin Islands? Maybe it might be. It might be the Virgin Islands. It's either that or the Marshall Islands. I forget which. Oh, right. But, um. Anyhow, so yeah, we've got fifty-four National Guards. Device, you know, further divided between Army Guard and Air Guard. Gotcha. And yeah, they're under state control, but the lion's share of the funding does come from the federal government. And officially, the president has to ask the the individual states for uh, activation of National Guard troops. But normally, it's you know, it's a fait accompli because you know, you either give them up or you don't receive your funding for the next fiscal year. Gotcha. So, I mean, this is this is fascinating because uh, as someone who studied the history of the American War of Independence many years mm-hmm. ago, uh, this is so it's echoing, you know, the, the the birth of the Constitution and the difference between the old Continental Army and the state militias, and um, it's it's there's there's a real kind of historical flavour to the the way that these various armed forces seem to work or operate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, now there is one other important distinction, and that is National Guard units have a, for lack of a better term, a civil defense function also. 
and respond to uh, state and national emergencies. Uh, Floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, um, civil disturbance, Mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, Will we have the potential to get called up to the point where as part of our annual training requirements, uh, when I was in, uh, in the infantry still, uh, we had uh, annual riot control training. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, we're not messing around. You know, we get the, we get mm-hmm. the four foot batons out and we, you know, take a look at some riot shields and we practice formations and that sort of thing. So it's, it's very much a part of the mission of the National Guard. And, uh, you know, with, with, not to get too, again, not to get too far down in the weeds, but, you know, since the tragedy at Kent State, there are quite a few more controls as, as to when the National Guard gets called out and right. how they're implemented and that sort of thing. But, yeah. But it, that's it in a nutshell. If you want to learn more, <laughs> you can go to, you know, Wikipedia will explain it well. Yeah, enough, yeah, yeah. So. Cool. Now, I just, it's, it's really fascinating having someone who's actually uh, involved with this do it. And I think, particularly for British audiences, I say, or, or British and European audiences, who's, uh, um, you know, armed forces are arranged in a very different kind of way. Uh, because obviously you're. America, the United States is a huge place and it's got a federal system and so it's quite interesting whereas in British we're very much used to centralised control over everything mm-hmm. and it's quite interesting hearing about the kind of the, 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 the state aspects of, of what's going on. Another important distinction is that all three arms or branches however you want to put it, the active reserve and national guard all have the same training requ- requirements and you can basically, for lack of a better term, cross-pollinate between schools. So, for example, oh, okay. uh, when I went to my initial entry training, I went to the same basic training as guard and active duty forces. When I went to AIT, it was the same AIT that active right. and reserve forces went to. And then, granted, I I am in a National Guard schoolhouse, but we do have active duty troops or active duty troops and reserve troops can and do come to our schoolhouse for some of the other courses we have. We have uh, vehicle operator transition training. We have uh, food service specialist transition training. We've got uh, communication specialist training. So they call it the total army school system. And we all work from the same textbooks and we all have the same courseware and we all have the same course requirements. And you know, in theory, and actually, I've I've been to some NCO education system schools where there were active reserve and guard troops all in the same class. So it's we we wear the same uniforms, we use the same weapons. It's the it's the whole whole enchilada. So it's been uh, largely standardized. The training and so forth has been standardized across the various forces. Yeah, and I want to say that actually goes back to. World War One, and I think since mm. World War One, there's been at least the yeah. Here's my previous guest, Miranda Summers would have <laughs> would be able to tell you a lot more detailed about this because that's her bailiwick. But uh, if you haven't listened to that episode, um, episode thirty nine, I believe it was Go listen to Mike it, at the museum. Mm. Uh, I spoke with Miranda Summers Lowe. She is a curator at. She's a military curator. Excuse me at uh, the Smithsonian's uh, Museum of American History. Right. And uh, her her bailiwick is mobilization and training oh, of, right. uh, of U.S. Armed Forces. But anyway, um, so yeah, we've had standardized training for the most part since World War I, and it was in the 90s when the full transition began, and with the global war on terror, especially yeah. now, Everyone gets the same training. Everyone's held to the same standards, and it's and it it makes for a better force all around. Sure, it, it and I think history proves that. But anyway, sure. So I'm mean, just <clears throat> catching up. What I was starting to say there. So when you went to uh, Afghanistan, you were a National Guardsman. Yes. And what were you at that point? Were you a sergeant at that point? Yeah, I was a sergeant E5. Um, the equivalent. In reality, 
an American sergeant is probably closer in uh, duties and responsibilities as a British corporal. Gotcha. Okay. Because you're going to have uh, a team of, in, in an infantry unit anyway, a Sergeant E5 is going to have three soldiers directly reporting to him. Right. Okay. Yeah, that sounds kind of like a, a, court, a corporal with his own squad. Uh, over here so w- what kind of stuff i mean th- there's a, a question i want to kind of g- go back to because you you're you've mentioned a couple of times that you was you'd specialized in psychological operations uh, yes what's that <laughs> it's uh well practically speaking it's getting foreign nationals either armed or unarmed to do what you want them to do or modify their behaviors to support the uh, war fighting aims of the combatant commander in the field. Right. You know, for so, right, just to put it simply, getting people to do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. Gotcha. And uh, uh, there's something uh, in a, a term used by the British a lot is hearts and minds. Yes, absolutely. So it's that kind of thing is involved. Absolutely. Yeah. And we had a when I was in Bosnia, we had a British officer because I was a uh, I was a part of the combined joint information campaign task force. Wow, which is a which is a mouthful. Which means oh, that we man. had military organization is great, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> which means we had Americans, Brits, French, and Germans all all operating under the same command. Wow, and uh, that must have been interesting. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's and we had some they weren't necessarily the British troops I actually worked with most. I didn't really work with. They just happened to be in the office next door to mine. Oh, right. And they were in charge of keeping communications going in the Sarajevo area. Oh, right. And uh, I, I, I achieved my, or I attained my appreciation for HP sauce <laughs> under their tutelage <laughs> and uh, appreciation for the. Uh, for the Land Rover Defender, for example, and oh really, yeah, the term Bristol's as well. So. <laughs> Let's not go there. It's not that kind of show. No, no, Cockney rhyming slang in general, I should say. So. Fantastic, fantastic. So, <clears throat> when you actually saw active duty, I mean, uh, how did you feel? I mean, did you actually come under fire at any point yourself? Yeah, in, in Afghanistan, I, I saw, and I've mentioned this on my show before, I, I saw one day of combat in my 365 days of, of uh, mobilization. I saw one day of combat, and I was in three firefights in that one day. Wow. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It's kind of like the fire brigade thing, isn't it, where you wait around and nothing happens until, until suddenly something does. And how did do, do you did you feel when it actually happened? Did you feel fully prepared for it? Were you surprised by the experience when it actually happened? Surprised isn't quite the term. Um, to put it mildly, I had to be told I was in a firefight. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. When it when it happened, there was basically we were uh, at the time I was an embedded uh, embedded trainer. Yeah. I was on an embedded training team. Uh, with the Afghan National Army. Oh, okay. And I was assigned as the mentor for the headquarters and headquarters company for an Afghan National Army Kandak, which is a battalion. And I was also the mentor for the S1 or personnel section. And which is interesting because I had, <laughs> as an E5 sergeant, I had almost no experience with S1 functions, but, mm. you know, there you go. You do what you have to do when you need to do it. Mm. And uh, we were actually going out on a multi-day mission to train up our Kandak on uh, cordon and search operations. And we were going up to the camp, the a a camp, where we were going to be staying for a couple, three days. And some shooting started, and we responded to it. Or actually, no, I take that back. Um, we were to meet a convoy. This is right before the elections in 2009. So it was, uh, July 30th, actually. We were supposed to meet a convoy of election materials and, and help get it back to Farah city. 
And before we met the convoy, or we were en route to meet the convoy, and we were in an area that was known Taliban or criminal gang, whoever it was, bad guys with guns anyway, activity, uh, to the point where the team I was with had been in some heavy action before I got there. And uh, we were driving along. I was in the turret and had a Mark 19 grenade launcher and a M240 machine gun. You, you Brits so, might refer to it as GPMG. Gosh. So, so you, were you in a Humvee or something, Jake? Yes. Yeah, 1151 uh, up-armored Humvee, uh, a low, relatively low squat, heavy vehicle that is barely – it barely has enough power to get itself around. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, we are driving along, and all of a sudden I heard a big bang, and I – Oriented on where the explosion came from and, you know, yelled into the mic, explosion, 7 o'clock, 200 meters. And then I, right as I said meters, there was another explosion. And I whipped around and said, 3 o'clock, you know, explosion, 3 o'clock, 50 meters. And my <laughs> my TC, that's truck commander or tank commander, uh, he was a Gulf War vet, actually. Oh, really? uh, and tanker. Uh, he's a, a tanker in the Gulf War. But anyway... Uh, he said, yeah, that the first one was an RPG firing and the second one's a, the RPG impacting in the ground and exploding. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do I do? Shoot where the first explosion came from. So <laughs> <laughs> whipped the old Mark 19 around and fired off a couple bursts at the compound where it came from. And we went on our merry way. And after that, I got a lot more tuned to the sights and sounds and experiences of getting shot at. And it's. It's a unique experience, to say the least. Mm. So it sounds as though, uh, I mean, you, you didn't have time to be scared or anything, uh, you, but obviously you were slightly disoriented because there was, that's, that's really interesting, actually, for people listening, I think. This thing that there were, you noted two explosions, but actually the first one had been the RPG firing, and it was the second closer one that was the thing actually landing and blowing up. Right. Uh, right. Because that's 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 the kind of detail I think that uh, obviously um, you you would hope your training would prepare you for. Did you feel your your training had pre- prepared you for that? Uh, or was apparently it apparently not? Because I had to be I had to be told I was in a firefight. So <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really interesting, Jack. That's really interesting. Um, I, I can tell you. Are you familiar with the Hammer Slammers novels by David Drake? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, John you know, Treadaway and he does the Hammer Slammers gaming. Yeah. Masses of- well, I, I can definitely tell you where he got the term buzz bombs from. Because as an RPG is flying by you, it makes a sound. Oh, really? Yeah. How extraordinary. And, uh, yeah, I, I got to find that out <laughs> firsthand. So it's... Now, yeah, that's, really, it, that's an interesting note there, Jay, because obviously, uh, you know, you're a man who loves his history, and we read uh, history books uh, about, you know, men under fire in all kinds of periods of history. And I think back to even, say, the Napoleonic Wars, where people describe the particular buzz of a musket ball going past, or uh, a cannonball actually sounds... Someone described it like a barrel rolling down an alleyway or something, uh, mm-hmm. which is... So the fact that, you know, th- this is still true, that presumably if you if you were around in combat for long enough, you'd be able to identify different types of mus- munition whizzing past your ear. Um, that's that's really fascinating, uh, but it also sounds. I mean, obviously now it's some time. This was you were saying back in what two thousand nine, Jay? Yeah, Ju- yeah, July of two thousand nine. Okay. So there's obviously now some distance between now and when that happened, mm-hmm. um, and you sound um, you know, quite clinical and dispassionate about it at the time. Did you feel clinical and dispassionate about it, Jay? <laughs> Um, or did you fi- did you find your adrenaline suddenly went through the roof? That's an interesting question. I, I think that a lot of I think a lot of the recall that I have is partially due to the adrenaline dumping. And the thing yeah. is, there's there is a physiological response to stress or trauma 
in some cases where details are lost. And this is just as a one of my additional duties is I'm a uh, sexual harassment and assault uh, victim advocate in the National Guard. Um, every unit has to have one, and we're actually blessed because we've got three in my unit currently. Right. But uh, uh, in our training, we've learned that uh, – it, it is quite common for people to forget or misremember things that happen under extreme stress. And part of that is your brain shifts into more of a survival mode and you focus on one thing to the exclusion of others sometimes. And I a, a big part of... A big part of why I am able to recall what I can recall is, and I'm sure there's stuff that I've forgotten about that day. I know there is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I don't want to say, uh, I don't want to put this. I've replayed and thought about that day enough so mm-hmm. that the salient points are still fresh. Yes. And that's not to say that I've sat and obsessed about it. Um, I've definitely given it due thought. And I think for me personally, it's helped me uh, to process um, those experiences and to keep me in a good place. Mm -hmm. I was lucky because nobody in my unit got hurt at all. None of us, our vehicles didn't even get hit with small arms fire. Really? Um, now, that's not to say that didn't happen to some of the Afghan locals because there mm-hmm. were quite a few civilian casualties. Uh, I don't know. Let's back up a little bit. From my understanding, the, the civilian casualties occurred due to Taliban or criminal gang, bad guys with guns, whatever they were due to their actions. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I certainly hope that's the case. I do remember on the day just seeing as we're coming into the area, there were civilians streaming from the area. So I'm pretty sure they knew what was up and they were getting out of the area as quickly as they can. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I, I can definitely hope that the, Civilian casualties were were limited, and mm. uh, but anyway. No, that, I mean that's. Uh, I mean, I it's. I'm really grateful for you talking so candidly about this show because this this is one of those things that fascinates me. Uh, and obviously, we've had since the end of well, this our involve our major involvement in the Afghan conflict. There's been quite a few documentaries mm-hmm. um, uh, over the years um, about this. A lot of very because obviously now guys are going into action with helmet cams and stuff, you know, um, uh, on mobile phones, and uh, it's it's one of those things that I think is, is interesting for me. Um, as a war gamer, actually, to, thinking about the kind of stuff that I'm happy to play as a gamer, uh, and the way you're describing your uh, sense of uh, discomfort about um, whether any, you know, the in- civilian involvement in an incident as you've described, that you experience. And uh, it's quite interesting that, that nowadays this is one of the burdens, of course, that um, soldiers, in particularly in conflict in that part of the world, um, carry with them all the time, isn't it? That you've got, you've got your training, uh, on the one hand, your military training, which makes you an effective fighting force for... Um, taking out the enemy but also these this factor nowadays where it's not always entirely clear not only where the enemy is but who the enemy is and and who's a non-combatant civilian uh, and so your rules of engagement and so forth uh, that you have to deal with are 
much more complicated than in some of, shall we say, the simpler wars. I mean, obviously, I, my first love is the 18th century, where certainly in Europe, generally speaking, there was a clear delineation between, OK, these are the guys who are doing the fighting, and we don't ever involve these other people, the civilians, in any way. Um, and it was a, a, in a time when it could be avoided, whereas now, of course, um, as a soldier, the, the psychological burden that you carry into and then after action um, is, a, is a very complex thing. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of what ifs. Yeah. And there were a number... And I've talked to fellow combat vets. Um, I, I won't name them by name, but anyway, he's a he's a combat vet of the Irish forces. Yeah. And uh, was in Lebanon and East Timor and saw the elephant in both places there. And I, I've talked right. to him at length about it. And, that, and that's that's one of the things is if there are some other veterans that are listening and are having difficulties, I have to tell you the best thing you can do is talk about it. If you can find someone who has similar experiences, all the better. And if you don't know who to talk to, you can talk to me. I will, I will gladly talk to anybody that, that needs help in that regard and hope, hope you, or I will help you find the resources where you are to, to, to get the help that you need. But, uh, anyhow, um, I, I did a lot of talking mm -hmm. and I'm okay with what happened that day. Uh, like I said, the, the best thing that could have happened that day was we all got out alive and uninjured and sure. we all did. Yeah. And, uh, I know that later on in the same area, um, there were some, there were some American casualties, including a guy that, uh, I knew and had, had worked with very briefly, but I still worked with them. And, right. uh, this, well, that's actually Memorial Day's tomorrow. And I, I always, I don't always think about him and I don't always think about mm -hmm. the guys that I knew that we lost in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but this weekend in particular, I, I do think about those guys and, uh, they weren't my best friends. I didn't, you know, or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I, you know, I definitely knew them. I, I worked with them sure. and, uh, three of them were in my battalion and one was a member of the unit that replaced us in Farah. So, oh, well. but anyhow, yeah, it, it's, now that's, and obviously for British listeners, uh, if there's, <clears throat> and you know, uh, there will be, um, once this goes public, I know that there's, uh, quite a number of X forces guys involved uh, um, in the hobby, and obviously combat stress. The first stop here in the UK is combat stress. Who do, do an absolutely amazing job, um, because obviously it's the kind of thing where, uh, as you say, Jay, talking to someone who uh, has been through the same thing or something similar, because it's never entirely the same for everyone, is it? You know, no. you can't. It, it's very easy to generalize and say, oh, yes, it's, the, it's all the same thing. It's all one thing. But actually, the uh, tra traumatic stress, that's one of the problems, is it's, it affects different people differently uh, to a different degree and in different ways. Uh, and even something, you know, let alone combat events. I mean, I think back to, you know, not so long ago, I lost my mother and the effect mm -hmm. that that's still having on me coming up for what 18 months later um when you think something's over and then suddenly the stuff pops into your head and you think god where did that come from uh takes you completely you know outflanks you completely really yeah. so it's important as you say to talk about these things so yeah absolutely thank you. there's yeah absolutely i mean it's you can't put too fine a point on it that post-traumatic stress it's not post-combat stress is it's post traumatic stress and it disorder and it's it can come from anything it can come from any type of traumatic event it could be a car accident it could be a yeah. sexual assault it could be a <clears throat> bad day in the ER it can be yeah you know anything that causes sufficient trauma to the person who experienced it yeah and um 
I'm not going to get too much on a soapbox, but I, I think that there are certain elements in American society that might look down on someone that ha- that is experiencing PTSD because their PTSD was not born out of combat or combat related mm. incident. And because at the end of the day, you don't know what's going on in someone else's head. Absolutely. You don't know what caused their stress. You don't know what caused their trauma. So you're not there to judge. And if, and if you're not there to help, then get out, get, get out, out, out of the, the way. way. Yeah. Let them find or help them find the resources they need to get the help they need. Because if you're not here to help your fellow man, one way or another, I've got no time for you. Yeah. If you're, you know, if you're going to lay claim to one experience or another, you know, do it on your time, not on mine. But anyway, um, here in the United States, folks who have experienced or have been deployed uh, can use the vet center. And there are vet centers all over the United States. And they are they are an arm of the Veterans Administration, but they are run separately, if that makes sense. Gotcha, yeah. And they have opened up their counseling services to not just uh, deployed military members, but also uh, what we call Gold Star families, which are the families of deceased service members and also victims of uh, military sexual trauma. And so if if you are. In one of those three categories, and you need help, uh, the, in my opinion, the best thing you can do is seek out your local or regional vet center. And I don't mind saying that I have sought those services myself, and I am very glad that I did. Good for you, mate. Good for you. Now, it's everyone needs to take their own path to healing um, and Certainly, as I say, and I mentioned them again, combat stress in this country. There are other charities, but particularly when it comes to uh, psychological trauma of one kind or another, combat stress is definitely the, the, the kind of go-to organisation for that. And, uh, of course, yeah, people know I've been raising money for them through my just giving efforts for years now mm-hmm. um and but the main thing quite apart from the money it's just the awareness uh, you know if if everyone were to make themselves aware of the kind of 24-hour contact number for someone like contact stress or the veteran centers over in the u.s it would make a heck of a difference jay thank you so much for telling us so much so candidly about your experience there I, I, i'm gonna kind of put that to one side for the moment, because I think um, it's um, yeah, I want to I want to bear in mind that it's, just, it's kind of a uh, an interesting subject uh, for a wargaming podcast, essentially. But I think this is one of the things that um, you know, like you, you set yourself up as the veteran wargamer, and so you're interested in talking about issues to do with veterans. And in a sense, so am I. But you know, I'm not a veteran myself, but obviously, um, I, I just want to say my willingness to speak candidly about my combat experience is directly related to a podcast called the Jocko podcast. Uh, the host is a former Navy SEAL commander named Jocko Willink. And oh, yes, yes, I've heard of him. episode 115, he speaks at length with Medal of Honor awardee Dakota Meyer. And so that it's on YouTube if you don't want to get it into your podcast machine, but Jocko podcast 115 with Dakota Meyer. Um, really, really uh, opened up my possibility of of speaking like I have today. So um, it's a long listen. It's about three hours of really, really heavy stuff. Wow. So, okay. you know. I'm sorry if you like your 20 minute podcast, this ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but mind you, it's probably uh, more informative than listening to me and Neil ramble on for three and a, three and a half hours on view from the veranda. But there you well, go. you know, uh, and you know, Jocko, not once, not once does Jocko talk about banana oil or plasticine. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's a mere amateur. Yes, uh, but cool. now I know who you're talking about. Uh, he's a monster guy, isn't he? he is, yeah, he's he's a large. Oh, he's large physically, and he's large. Uh, 
Uh, he has a very large presence to say the least. He's got a Ted talk on YouTube also about extreme leadership. Um, and it's, it's well worth the 12 minutes. Um, but anyway, enough, enough Jocko and more and more Henry and Jay. So I, I suppose quite apart from anything else, Jay, I'm, I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspects of warfare and the toll it takes and how, how can people prepare themselves for what they're going to experience and then how do they how do they deal with what they then actually end up experiencing and of course i think many is back in the 1970s now wasn't it john keegan wrote that amazing book the face of battle i love that book an amazing book which was one of the first times that i can remember that an academic historian uh basically presented what battle looks like at the real sharp and dirty end. Uh, I mean, obviously, one of the other things is that there have been uh, studies done, particularly in the US Army, to its credit, actually, compared to the British, for sure, uh, since kind of Korea and Vietnam on, I think because so many people came back from those wars utterly traumatised by what they'd experienced, uh, it, the, the American services in particular kind of had to w wake up. Um, there was a, a book by... John Ellis called The Sharp End, I think it was called. Um, again, back in, that was probably the early 1980s, which was another great book that informed my opinions, um, you know, when I when I was kind of a, a young man. Um, I was probably at or just come out of university at the time I read that. Uh, lots of uh, reports from the front line of how soldiers coped with being in action and these interesting things statistics about how many guys actually get to fire their weapons mm -hmm. um we'd obviously read in it i can think of uh descriptions from the american civil war was it bull run where they found muskets lying on the ground that had been loaded and reloaded like a dozen times without the trigger actually being pulled right um this is you know fascinating stuff because i think um as war games and this is where i kind of want to move on jay to how what you've experienced in real life kind of informs your 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 gaming is as war games we often um make assumptions that you know we'll give orders to certain units and they will do as they were t they're told <laughs> which obviously the, re the reality is often somewhat different and it's in recent years really that games like you know to that largest chain of command which i know you're keen on yeah. uh have come about with a big dollop of uh, what rich because he's a Klaus Fitzian would call friction yes um and They've, you know, so this is kind of leads me on. You know, you're you're a guy who's actually seen the elephant, uh, and you've kind of been there, and obviously, you know, you're 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 honest and realistic about it. You know, you're you're in this you're, you're in this vehicle that comes under fire, and you know, you have you have a long tour of duty where nothing happens, and then one day where everything seems to go off, and um. So in a sense, it's like, in what ways, if at all, mm -hmm. do you feel your real life kind of combat experience has informed your gaming or what you expect or want from your 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 gaming? Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a limited applicability if you're talking about a Napoleonics game. Uh, not necessarily. Possibly, probably. But not necessarily. go ahead, explain. Go ahead. Um, not necessarily my combat experience, but definitely my overall training and uh, one of the, you know, I, I started the Tactical Tutor series with you. And those principles of MetTC, you can apply that to a Napoleonic game table. You can apply that to a Roman Civil War table. You can apply that to uh, the lands of Flifthasatha or, you know, whatever... <laughs> whatever fantasy or science fiction setting you're you're in because it's it still applies um you americans with your pronunciation what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> oh excuse me it's leviosa I... yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um no uh, a future article um that i'm actually going to steal from my friend john isbrand is going to talk about the uh 
the principles of warfare and they still apply. And I actually used those same, I applied those same principles uh, to a paper my senior year of college. And I applied the, the modern U S army principles of warfare to what Caesar reported in De Bello Gallico, uh, specifically his conquest of, of uh, transalpine Gaul. And, um, it's, it's definitely applicable. You just got to understand where to apply it. You know, you're, you're not going to have much success trying to apply rate, rate of fire tables from the modern day to a Napoleonic game. No, absolutely. You're correct. But, you know, you still have to identify what your mission is. You still have to identify what your enemy's doing and what he's capable of. You have to identify what your troops are capable of. You know, are you asking them to do more than can be done? Uh, there's an intangible quality that my experience has allowed me to understand that things aren't going to go right. And I, I might get frustrated, but I don't blame the rules when things don't go right. Um, a perfect example of that is, um, and I had to be reminded of this by, by Lardy Nick, but, uh, a recent game of, or maybe it was Rich, I forget, but uh, a recent game of What a Tanker. You know, my little Stug sat there three turns in a row, reloading like a madman because all I could get were were a choir, and uh, I was in the middle of a middle of a wood. I couldn't see out. I had plenty of a choir, had plenty of ammo, I had plenty of reload, baby, but <laughs> I couldn't move to save my life. <laughs> and it was it was three, four turns where I just sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I thought, man, this is dumb. You know, this is obviously obviously the rules are broken. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and just had to, re- you know, be reminded each discrete turn is maybe 15 seconds of real time. Mm, yeah. Maybe. And <clears throat> maybe the driver has has ground the gears or maybe the engine just stopped or maybe a hundred other things that can go wrong with a vehicle. Cause trust Mm. me, (laughs) anything that can go wrong (laughs) will go wrong. And it it feels, it feels like I think any rules that I publish, that needs to be rule number one. And that needs to just be, you know, take, taking a page from Douglas Adams, you know, the very first page of any war games rules should read, don't panic. <laughs> and, and the second page to say anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And yeah. just get yourself in that mindset because it's not that your unit or your troops aren't doing what you want them to do because it's mm. going to happen. Mm. And there are all sorts of ways that that can happen. And even with, you know, you, you can make the argument that even with our, our modern automated communication systems, there's even more chance for something to go wrong now. Oh yeah, yeah. Because you know, we've got all these great communication systems, but you know, how many times have they not worked? And and yeah, this yeah. is the case that I've experienced. There was a movie I watched on BBC television just recently about uh, called Kajaki. Uh, uh set uh, it was the three power defending the Kajaki dam and reservoir up in the mountains in Afghanistan, which is uh, one of those harrowing episodes of Three Paris history that they've ever had to endure. It was a terrible thing. And one of the major problems they had, uh, was it the um, the Klansman um, radio system that the British had at the time that was just notoriously unreliable? Um, and so therefore, uh, yeah, communications problems and the fact that they can come out of nowhere... Uh, in a way that no war gamer would be prepared to tolerate. Right. <laughs> I think this is the thing, isn't it? That um, actually, as I say, as war gamers, and I know I do this myself sometimes, partly, Jared, I realise it sort of depends what kind of mood I'm in. I need to be in the right mood to tolerate a game that's got an awful lot of friction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are other times when I, I love 
um, you know, that kind of big battle command and control where you have at least a reasonable chance, if you're a decent general, of pulling off some stunning manoeuvres. Uh, and if just every game you play is just as it feels like stuttering, like it's just constant friction, it can all become a bit too much. I think the thing is also it depends on the period because with something like World War Two or moderns, because as you pointed out there, uh, a move or a phase. In fact, in chain of command is quite interesting because a move can be a really long thing, can't right. it? But it's divided into lots of little phases uh, because someone actually has to decide to end the move, don't they? Um, but, but so each one of those discrete phases, as you say, could just be a few seconds. Uh, but actually, the irony is it's taking you longer to play that phase than the time it actually represents. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and this is one of those wargaming things that I think we we often forget. And we come away thinking, well, you know, we played that game, we played a dozen moves, um, and, oh, you know, I was very frustrated. But those dozen moves, in terms of actual, if you like, action time, might only represent half an hour mm-hmm. or an hour at the most um it's not you you've taken all day to play that game but actually you the representation took longer than it was portraying in reality uh it's one of those strange kind of squiffy things we have to do in our heads as war gamers isn't it you know we sort of we we overlook the fact that many units their their frontage is way out of out of kilter with their depth but that's because pe- war gamers in horse and musket games they do like to see at least two ranks of figures yeah. so they'll overlook the fact that even a single rank of figures is actually far too deep um and the time scale is certainly one of those things where uh, yeah as you say it might take you 20 minutes to play something that represents 15 seconds uh curious isn't it and therefore as you say, your description of the Stug in the woods, where, yeah, it's quite realistic. I know if I've stalled the car, <laughs> it might take me a minute or two to get it started again. Right. Uh, and that represents probably three or four or five phases in chain of command. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, look, so looking at it the other way, so uh, in the other way, has your wargaming uh, affected, informed in any way your what you do in real life as a soldier? That's an interesting question. Um, just to backtrack one one little bit, uh, I will say that as a as a war game player, I do a lot of things on the table where I should know better. But <laughs> 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 you know, the, the classic example is I am very, I'm. V- overly aggressive when I play commands and colors. Um, if there is an opportunity to follow up in battle with, yeah. you know, heavy cap, you know, with cavalry or heavy infantry, I, I generally will. <laughs> yeah. And I, I get, I get overly aggressive and usually to my detriment, but <laughs> when I'm, 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 I'll stand there or sit there or however in, think ah, do I really want to go after those guys ah. yeah. well yeah. fortune favors the bold all right let's go yeah exactly <laughs> so. yeah I so. know the feeling Jay because yeah. I'm, I'm when I play I'm very much a cavalry man myself you know give me heavy cavalry that can break through and I'm in heaven yeah that's, that's what I like that's one of the best things it I I play when I play in uh, Commands and Colors Napoleonics and I'm teaching someone for the first time, I go to Garcia Hernandez and oh, right. because you start with those units in square and you get to you get, you know, let's get the square rules out right right away. And and I think the French just have cavalry in that in that uh, scenario. Mm. And man, what a fun scenario. And um I just got done listening to uh, uh, Bernard Cornwell's history of Waterloo. And he talks about, he talks about Garcia Hernandez and 
how it was the only, really the only time that cavalry broke square. And it was, for lack of a better term, by accident when, yeah, yeah. when a, a, I don't remember if it was a King's German Legion Dragoon horse got killed and crashed yeah. into the square. Yeah, and well, I guess yeah, I guess the British forces are all, uh, yeah, are all uh, cavalry, are all cavalry. But yeah, KGL horsemen and his horse just both got killed on the spot and just kept on yeah. going, and yeah. basically they poured into the square through the gap that was created because uh, yeah, it's you know, you've got a ton of horse flesh and another 200, 250 Absolutely. pounds of guys on a. You know, guy with all of his kit, you know, that's that's Absolutely. a lot of weight bearing down on you going at a full gallop, 25, at least 25, 30 miles an hour anyway. So, exactly. Well, here's a bit of history, Jay. You might remember, uh, if you've now got the old Battle Games magazines, <clears throat> I got an illustrator to do a limited edition print for subscribers to Battle Games magazine of the breaking of the square at Garcia Hernandez. So that battle actually is of a huge sentimental value to me. It's because it is one of the few extremely rare documented cases of what was a fully formed square being broken by cavalry. Um, and if, of course, then after the because in fact the French I think formed three squares. So there was the front one got demolished. Then the second square, having seen that happen, got a bit nervous and wobbly, and then the cavalry broke that as well. And then the third square just dis <laughs> disintegrated and fled, as as I recall. Um, but yes, it was a, a dramatic incident, thanks to a dead horse. There you go. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was indeed the abrupt ending to my recording with Jay. Uh, we were using a piece of online software called Zencaster, which stores the recording up in the cloud. And what happened was that Jay's internet router decided to do a double backflip with triple Salco or something of the kind and crashed and burned, uh, leaving me talking to myself. Uh, it took me actually several <laughs> minutes to realize I was talking to myself because I was wittering on and on and eventually realized, gosh, Jay's gone very quiet. Hello, Jay. Hello, Jay. And there was no reply. And gradually it dawned on me that, oh, he's gone. And uh, we communicated via Facebook Messenger, and I discovered that he was at the other end uh, in his basement in uh, Illinois, uh, swearing at his computer equipment. Um, anyway, fortunately, as you can tell, Jay managed to salvage the recording files um, contacting the help desk at Zencaster and with lots of head scratching and he managed to provide me with uh, the relevant two tracks for me to be able to cut and chop and paste together the show that you've just been listening to so thank you Jay for all your amazing efforts uh, which managed to salvage our chat uh, just before I go though I I want to say a very sincere thanks to Jay for having spoken so openly and so candidly about his experience to do with his service, uh, particularly in Afghanistan, which led to him himself uh, suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, for which, as he so honestly described, he sought and received help uh, himself and that he is you know he's basically such an amazing guy he's so willing now to pass on that experience to others who've experienced something similar uh, encouraging uh, veterans service veterans to get in touch with him uh, and also uh, the fact that he's now one of the counselors in his unit for people who have suffered uh, sexual trauma uh, which is sadly <clears throat> something that we've become much more aware of recently uh, I mean it's good that we've become aware of it it's sad that it's been happening for so long uh, with no help being given to the victims but that is clearly now being addressed particularly in the American Armed Services which is an 
excellent thing that's all to the good um and also um don't forget you you can contact jay at any time you want if you want to talk to him about that kind of stuff um and of course as i've mentioned repeatedly in the show here if you're a uk veteran uh, with any kind of similar issues uh, the organization to contact is combat stress so thanks to all of you for listening. I know that it's <laughs> you might have been expecting it just a wargaming podcast. It turned into being something quite different from that. But I, I sensed as we were recording it that I just wanted to let Jay talk and say what he wanted to say. And I think it's provided us all with some incredibly valuable insights into what it means to be a soldier in a modern army in a modern conflict zone. And I'm really, really grateful to Jay for having uh, as I say, been so candid about that. At times, it was probably slightly difficult to listen to, but these are difficult subjects, uh, but we're all grown-ups, and I think it's important that we do listen to service veterans when they have something to say about this kind of thing. Uh, obviously, we spend most of our time as hobbyists just playing with our model soldiers um, or our board games but the reality of what we're portraying is something that should always be at least in the back of our mind and that we should acknowledge that uh, what we're doing is just playing a game and as Donald Featherstone used to say there are no plastic widows and orphans when we play our war games. So thanks again to Jay. Thanks to all of you for listening. I'll get Jay back on the show uh, again, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, where we'll talk about some stuff that's much more frivolous. Um, but for the time being, uh, I wish you all well, and I'll speak to you again very soon.